Adolf Hitler was responsible for some of the most terrible crimes against humanity in the history of the world. But he was also responsible for one of the most successful cars the world has ever seen. Dr. Ferdinand Porsche designed the KDF Wagen, KDF standing for Strength Through Joy, for Hitler in the late 1930s. Germany's car industry had cooperated unwillingly in the, de in the development of the car, and although they offered to build the finished prototype, Hitler himself decided the new car would be built in an all-new factory with a new town to support it and its workers. That town was called Wolfsburg. By the end of 1939, the car the world was to know as the Beetle was ready for production, but then larger affairs of state intervened and the Second World War started. During the war, Wolfsburg was turned into a military machine and bombed heavily for its pains. The story of how a British army major walked into the derelict factory in 1945, restarted production of the Beetle for army staff cars, and ultimately, after offering it to Ford and Triumph and General Motors and being turned down, set it up as a car factory again. In 1946, the bombed-out shell had built 10,000 Beetles. By 1948, the 25th 1,000th had been built, and the 1 millionth Beetle was built in 1955. Today, with the car still being built in South America, production has exceeded 21.5 million units. Of course, the world has moved on from the comparatively basic Beetle. Production in Europe ceased 20 years ago. Nevertheless, the Beetle still has a powerful hold on people's imaginations. And the appearance of Concept One, a Beetle-inspired design exercise on a golf platform at the 1994 Meadow Show, was a sensation. Volkswagen said it had no plans to build the car, but it was inundated with inquiries from Europe and the States. Within months, the company was forced to announce that the car would be a production model, and it's now being built in Mexico. Will the new Beetle Mania be as strong as that of its legendary predecessor? Well, that, as they say, is up to you. You're witnessing a little bit of modern motoring history. Hundreds, possibly thousands of us media tarts, attending the launch of the most intriguing car of the 1990s. And as day breaks here in the heart of the American Bible Belt, the cars you see here will probably end up in collections and museums around the world because they are in fact the first, the very first, new Beatles ever to venture out onto public roads anywhere in the world. Of course there are plenty more where those come from. The new Beetle factory in Mexico is working overtime churning out as many bugs as it possibly can trying to satisfy demand in America where sales start this spring. Then there's a little matter of building cars for Germany and 101 other markets around the globe too. Now the Beetle will be such a late arrival in British showrooms for one very simple reason. Left hand drive versions are the priority and are built first. Right hookers, the ones we want, will be made when the Mexicans get around to it. Like I say, they're promising to lay off the tequila and the tacos and start deliveries to the UK by early 1999. But don't hold your breath, I reckon they'll be later than that. As you can see, the front end of the new Beetle looks remarkably similar to the original if you ignore those classy Porsche 911 like headlamps for a moment. And the car looks especially good in this magnificent metallic silver. But no matter what shade the car is, its side and rear views are absolutely spot on. But anybody who dares criticise the new Beetle's architecture is off their trolley. The hard to impress journalists from around the world are saying that, and so are the top designers who don't even work for VW but admire the new Beetle enormously. And most important of all, the ordinary men and women in the street loved this car when they saw it in and around Atlanta. It didn't matter whether they were rednecks and good old boys in pickup trucks or they were office girls in their cheap sports cars, they all fell in love with the new Beetle, male or female. And I have to say, so did I. The overall appearance gets a 10 out of 10. The interior is too lavishly equipped. I ask you, illuminated vanity mirrors in a Beetle, but most of it's very tastefully done and the solitary dial including the speedo, rev counter and fuel gauge is brilliantly simple and very very well designed. Turn the ignition key and there's virtual silence. Remember the new Beetle is a golf under the skin and that means a super quiet front mounted power pack. In fact too quiet for my liking, 
The appeal of the original Beetle was that it sounded like your dad's Qualcast lawnmower. There's a bit of annoying wind noise from around the A-pillars when you're out on the road in the new Beetle, and driver vision ain't brilliant thanks to those thick A-pillars which stupidly have tweeters and speakers at the bottom to make them even thicker, about 10 inches thick in fact, not a good idea. And while we're picking up on the Beetle's negative points, the rear headroom is an absolute joke. But the new Beetle's plus points outweigh the bad by about, well, 100 to 1. The Beetle isn't just making a comeback, it's doing it in style. The execution is phenomenally good. The car looks great in pictures, on motor show stands and on the road where it counts. It makes fellow drivers smile and wave. And like all golfs, remember, I keep saying this, it's like nothing more than a golf under the skin. It drives superbly. Now, I'd like you just to stop for a minute and spare a thought if you can for poor old Father Christmas. You see, he's having a tough time this year, fulfilling all those Christmas wishes. His problem is that this is at the top of the Christmas wish list this year. It's the Volkswagen Beetle, back with a bang, and it seems we just can't get enough of them. Volkswagen unveiled this ray of sunshine in Motor City, Detroit, earlier this year. The mere sight of this car being driven onto the stage at Detroit was enough to bring a tear to the eye of even the most hardened motoring journalist. After all, the Beetle is one of the few cars that really sums up a whole generation. And as we love nothing better than to wallow in the past, 90s Beetle is the perfect vehicle to make that journey back to the 60s in. Now, 90s Beetle is a little confusing. Its silhouette is unmistakably the Beetle, but that's about all it shares with the original people's car. For a start, you won't find the engine in the back. It's been promoted to the front, and you get a choice of this 2-litre petrol version or a 1.9-litre TDI, both of them borrowed from the Golf. The Beetle also shares its floor pan with the Golf, along with the Audi A3, the Seat Toledo, the Skoda Octavia and no doubt quite a few more. And once you get inside you'll probably find that you recognise plenty of the switch gear as well. Do take heart, all you nostalgia fans out there, because nestling inside the minimal black and chrome interior, you'll find a true hint of 60s flower power, a bud vase. But while the 90s driver may well nip to their designer florist to pick up some trendy tropical balloon to keep in it, they're just as likely to be making full use of the power outlet for their laptop, putting their cappuccinos in the cup holders, and will no doubt have noted with approval the fact that there are heated seats for those cold winter months. The thing about the Beetle is that although we did love the old one very much, after all, 21 million of them were sold around the globe, if we're being honest, they were actually pretty awful to drive. And I should know. I learnt to drive in a 1303 Beetle and for years thought that the awkward pedal position, the bus-like steering wheel and the appalling heater were normal in the car. But I'm happy to report that this 2-litre petrol version isn't bringing back any of those memories for me. This is Volkswagen motoring 90s style. The four-cylinder engine is good for 115 brake horsepower and yes, it will actually get you from 0 to 60. It also has a top speed of 112 miles per hour. Herbie will be turning in his grave. The new Beetle does drive remarkably like the Golf, which isn't, I suppose, that surprising. In fact, dare I say it, the ride actually feels 
firmer and ooh, is a bit more enjoyable than that of the Golf. The four-speed automatic transmission is smooth and it responds well. And the brakes, well, they're absolutely light years away from those spongy old things the Beetle used to have. But let's be honest, who really gives a damn about the 90s technology, the 12-year anti-corrosion warranty or the extremely high levels of safety? The real reason we will buy this car in droves is because of how it makes us feel. When you first see it, you don't know whether you want to hug it or drive it. I can feel a remake of Herbie coming on. Even if you can get your hands on one of the 1,000 left-hand drives that VW will be bringing in next Easter, the prices seem to be spiralling. In the States, the base model costs around 10 grand. One of these left hookers, if you can get your hands on one, is likely to be closer to 16. And when the right-hand drives finally do arrive, the prices will mean that the people's car is now rather out of reach to many of us. But Volkswagen know that even the price won't put us off. Beatlemania has set in, and there are that many people desperate to get their hands on one that the factory in Mexico is at production to 160,000 a year. Well, the Men and Motors team has been given the task to uh, test drive the Beetle, so we've come across one here. This one's in pretty good shape, and they've been kind enough to us here at Oakville Volkswagen in beautiful Oakville, Ontario, to let us test drive this. Hang on a minute. Got the wrong key here or something. What you, let's try this one. Hey. Hey, come on, get in. Let's take this one instead. Well, we are tooling around in this new Beetle in beautiful Oakville, Ontario. I've been in the car about 20 minutes now, my first ever drive in the 98 VW Beetle. Some of my observations, it drives very smoothly, we're driving the stick shift by the way, but there's a few things that I notice as I'm sat in the driver's seat. First of all, the dashboard is incredible. You could change a baby on the dashboard on either side. Um, we can smell that the engine is, is warm, but we don't know by looking at the dash how hot the, uh, the rad is because there's no gauge that tells us. I imagine a light comes on if we get into trouble though. Uh, the horn is, I think, a mantra to the 60s. That's a sound I think that they reincorporated into the car. There's no uh, interior ceiling light. Instead, the light is underneath the rear view mirror here. And of course, there's uh, nighttime and daytime settings for the rear view mirror. Uh, nice and round, the curves are nice in the car, but uh, it's a little, it's a bit cramped for my liking. I would have liked to have seen it a little bit bigger, but then again, it is a Beetle. Uh, they've got, of course, nice rounded knobs and, you know, fittings. I mean, the indicator that I'm using now, it's, it feels really nice at the end of the fingers. And uh, we pull out onto Lakeshore Road in Oakville. And we're going to go down to the boats in a minute and have a look around and open the, the trunk, or what you would call the boot, and open the hood, or what you would call the bonnet. And we're going to have a look at this thing. You won't believe under the bonnet, by the way. We looked in the showroom model, and uh, they have crammed so much in, it's incredible. To indicate, which I failed to do then, the uh, indicator stem, the flasher, feels very, very nice at the end of your fingers. It's nice and smooth and ergonomically designed, I think they call it. And uh, the steering wheel's nice, nice and smooth. It's what they call a three-spoke design. I think you know what that is without any further explanation. You've got, uh, you know, windshield intermittent and all that and spray, touch spray and whatever they call that. You can adjust your mirror, a power mirror over here, left or right. You know the doohickeys. I've got the wipers going now and I don't know how to turn them off. Hang on. There we go. Standard on the new 98 Beetle is airbags for the driver and the passenger and side airbags as well. Also standard is the air conditioning right here, which is nice for the hot climates, although I don't think for the British market they'll have air conditioning as standard. Would you think they would? I don't think so. Pay a little extra for that, for the three days that you might need it in Britain. It's always raining! And here we are by the water. It's not much of a guardrail there, is there, Phil? Here we go. No pedestrians, I hope? No. The original Beetle in 1954 was just under $1,300, that's US dollars, and manufactured in Germany. The 1998 Beetle is about $19,000. That's Canadian. In US dollars, 15. 
manufactured now in Mexico. A couple of other comparisons for you quickly. Back then it was a 36 horsepower engine at 3700 RPM. Nowadays it's, well for the gas powered engine, 115 horsepower at 52,000 RPM. And they're doing a diesel powered engine soon, that'll give you 90 horsepower at 4000 RPM. The Beetle may be a sensation, but what other fun cars can you get for the money? Find out after the break. In part one, we drooled over the new VW Beetle, but what else could you drive to get you noticed? I learned something the other day. I always thought hot rods were something that American teenagers built out of old Ford V8s. Not true. The term comes from the 1920s in Britain when a Rolls-Royce engineer was asked to develop a racing engine for an air race and he got 1500 horsepower out of a, an engine that had previously only developed 800. His name Rodwell Banks, hence Hot Rod. This is a name that's much more familiar, Plymouth. And this is the Prowler. It's the only Hot Rod made by a mass manufacturer. When I say mass manufacturer, they're going to make 3,000 of these things and Plymouth say there's currently 30,000 on the waiting list. So, why do so many people want a car like this? The answer is dramatic good looks. I mean, it really stunned the measuring press when it was first shown at the 1996 International Motor Show. Since then, only three have come into the country. This is one of them, and there's going to be no more either because SVA, Special Vehicle Approval, simply will not cope with the way the lights, the bumpers and the front wings are organised on this car. And it does go as you imagine an old hot rod Ford really would. It's quite funny looking into the eyes of drivers coming the other way as well because they perceptibly widen as you come around the corner. Chrysler claimed that this has European standards of steering, road holding and handling. Not quite sure where they get those European standards from. It's very light aluminium chassis, aluminium suspension and a composite body shell means the whole thing is very light. So even though it's a V6, it's a mouth go. This automatic transmission is interesting. It uh, converts to a sort of slap shift and you can go up and down through the gears just bashing it either way. A bit frightening on the move because with the left-hand drive here you simply cannot see that offside front wheel and the car's wider than you think. Now if you did come to the top of the waiting list in the States you could drive away in your Plymouth Prowler for around £25,000-£26,000. If you wanted to buy this, which is the only one in the country, it's £80,000. I know exclusivity comes expensive, but that's very expensive. It's often said that the motor industry is becoming more and more international. Well, just to underline that point, here we are in the fantastic surroundings of the Italian Apennine Mountains to test drive a new German car that's built in Hungary and it's going to be launched in the UK next year. Confused? Well, have patience, children. All will soon be revealed because this is the Audi TT Coupe, first shown at the 1995 Frankfurt Show as a design exercise, and then in Tokyo in 1996. Such was the reception of the car by press and public that Audi decided to put it into production. Of course, the name of the Audi TT game is aerodynamics. This is one of the most aggressively, sleekly styled cars ever to come out of the Audi factory. But despite the dramatic shape, the underpinnings are relatively mundane because this shares engine, transmission and floor pan with the Audi A3, the new Volkswagen Golf and the upcoming Volkswagen Beetle. And that's why the Audi engineers could get it into production in just two years. Oh, and built in Hungary, well, 
The bodies are assembled and painted at the Audi plant at Ingolstadt. They're put on a train and sent to Hungary where the engine plant is. The engine's put in, the car's assembled, it's put back on the train and sent back to Ingolstadt again. You understand it? Somebody does. Um, out here in Italy, blazing up and down the Italian roads, um, the Germans are showing us cars here and they've, they've shown us a two-wheel drive. You've decided not to take that in the UK. Why not? That's right, because we felt this was such a statement for Audi um, that we wanted to combine the, the heart of Audi, which is Quattro. When you say to people Audi, almost the next word is Quattro. And so we felt this ultimate car, this ultimate coupe for us, um, was going to be a Quattro. And, uh, and our customers who we've researched into this absolutely agree with us. So the TT will only be a Quattro car. Our Audi customers are, are, are old buffers. I mean, they're all in their 50s and 60s. They won't go for something like this, surely. Oh, that's a very old view, Chris, of the, uh, of the uh, customer makeup. Our customer profile has changed quite dramatically over the, uh, the last few years. We've seen our sales go from 19,000 a year up to what will be 40,000 this year. So we're attracting a much, much younger view of that, uh, that profile, that customer, and, and our new customer profile. Um, will be very, very attracted to this. And I actually think some of what you uh, disparagingly called old buffers, Chris, will also be very interested in it. Well, we're the ones with the money, you see, that's <laughs> what it is. Inside, the car is as obviously styled as the exterior. This dimpled aluminium trim theme is repeated everywhere. Door handles, steering wheel, air outlets, gear stick, gear stick surround, even the pedals are mock-ups of racing car competition design. The leading edge of the screen gives a very low-browed feel to the car, and at some city centre traffic lights I know, you're going to have to be leaning forward and peering up to see the red. However, the test for a car that simply shouts its sporting aspirations so loudly is, does it go? In the case of the TT, well, need you ask. I don't think they'll have any trouble at all in getting rid of the first thousand cars that'll come in in 1999 and the 2,000 cars that'll come in in the year 2000. Queue up now.